Good morning to the Cranley community. We are live for our final Cranley Connects morning with you all for term two. I really, really don't know where the time has gone, especially with everything we're trying to manage at the moment as families, as educators, as parents, as pupils themselves. But I'm so, so excited about this final talk for term two. We are about to embark on, or we've started, it's the 1st of March. We're about to embark on Mindful March. And it's more important now than ever to be reflective, to be present, and to actually take a little bit more notice about our bodies and what's around us. Now, I'm going to introduce our special guest, but what makes it even more special is that it is one of our parents. And we're starting to see this year so many more parents speaking on really, really important topics. And that highlights to us as a community how knowledgeable and how talented our parent body are. So thank you so much to those parents who are coming forward to offer their time, which is really, really precious with, with the times we find ourselves in. Um, so I'm going to bring on Misha. Good morning, Misha. Good morning, Natasha. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Um, we are so, so lucky to have you here. And um, I know how humble you are, but I think it's important that um, our listeners this morning actually find out a little bit more about you, especially with how talented um, that I've got to know you over the last um, few terms. And I know you've had an amazing impact on our Cranley Community Committee when you met them a few months ago. So this is just a little bit about Misha. Misha has a master's in counselling. She's a registered member of the British Association for Counselling and Psychotherapy, and she's got a certification in fertility coaching and counselling. She's also a mindful coach, and she's a certified kids mindfulness trainer. So from my, from my side as a parent, I don't know how she does it. Misha Masoof is a mental health counsellor, as I've said, and she also um, has built um, a, she's a mindfulness coach. She's been working therapeutically with diverse adult and teen clientele in Singapore, London, and now the UAE. So you're very, very well traveled, Misha. Her experience includes working with couples and adults as a fertility counselor, as well as working at a teenage crisis center and conducting mindfulness-based programs for adults and young people. She has created Mindfulness Tribe to create a safe space for mental health conversations in the community, spreading the word on the power of mindfulness through workshops, consultation and well-being programs. As I've said, Misha, I have no idea how you've done that as a parent yourself. And I feel like you're so special now to come into our lives, number one as a parent and as a community member, but now to share your wisdom um, to the community. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to you, Misha. But before I do, please can everyone that's watching do pass on your questions through the Facebook chat and the YouTube chat, just so we can ensure we really, really utilize this time we have with our expert. Over to you, Misha. Thank you very much. Uh Natasha, for this introduction, um, I'm going to share my screen now, um, just to make sure that we have the PowerPoint on and running. Right. So thank you for the introduction, uh, Natasha. As a Cranley parent and um, community member. I am so grateful for these wonderful initiatives that you've taken um, and the school has taken and the wonderful Cranley committee has taken, some of whom I've had the pleasure to meet virtually. Um, when I was coming into Abu Dhabi last year, um, I was unsure of how we could connect to the community. And I'm so happy that um, that these initiatives um, are where is, is providing us a way to be able to connect in a safe way. Um, before I would start off with my talk today about mindfulness, I thought it'd be um, interesting to share my own personal journey of, of mindfulness and how I found mindfulness. Uh, being an expat, I've moved um, multiple times over the past 10 years. Um, and I'm sure as some of you uh, have been in the same position, you understand how difficult that transition would be and I believe it was in my third move that I felt um, untethered, lost, 
constantly looking back at uh, things that I was missing out back home, um, at occasions and events that I'm losing. And I found myself anxious in this new environment, um, unable to understand why I felt this way, why I was not able to embrace this new opportunity. Um, and through mindfulness and self-compassion, I learned to be kind to myself. I learned to be grateful for the opportunity given to me and to be more present uh, in, in that moment um, from there on and learn to be more compassionate to me when I need it the most. So that was just a little bit of, of how I found mindfulness. And I hope that during this talk today that I can share some of um, how some of the ways that mindfulness can, can help you as well. Um, the first half of the talk would be about um, why we would need mindfulness, just some of the reasons that we would, that we would need mindfulness. And the second part would be about the different approaches and ways that we can use mindfulness in our lives. So I'm going to start off with a favorite quote of mine um, by John Gabbardson, wherever you go, there you are. So one of life's greatest ironies is, is that no matter how much you want to be somewhere or how much you want to be there, wherever you go, there you are. So if you go to work, there you are. If you go and have dinner, if you're having dinner with family, there you are. If you're moving countries, there you are. We often look to the past or the present, um, or instead of the present, look to the future um, and not wanting to be in the present moment. Uh, we often um, look back and and look at past things and events that are happening um, or we look into the future for unseen things that we cannot control so these what ifs that um, th that we that we have in our lives what if I took that job opportunity you know so I could have been on a on a different career path um, what if I didn't relocate? So this is my own personal uh, what if that I shared with you. Things would have been looking differently if I hadn't made that move. Or what if I fail? So in the future, looking out to an event or a goal that you perhaps have wanted to achieve and, and you're um, unsure of stepping that way because you're thinking, what if I fail? So everyone has their own what ifs and uh, you know your own personal what ifs. But at the end of the day, whatever sentence that begins with what if is definitely not in the present moment. So when I was doing my training in mindfulness, there was a word for this anxious, frenzied state, um, a word for, for the state of mind which is distracted, always anxious, always in a hurry, always wanting to be somewhere, um, which is called the monkey mind, the inner critic. You So the inner critic jumps from one thought to the other. The monkey mind jumps from one thought to the other, just as a monkey would jump from one branch to the other. So we, while we're doing that, while we're jumping from one thought to the other without staying present, without being in the moment, we're feeding our what ifs and we're stifling our creativity. We're creating fear not wanting to, to, to be at one place, not wanting to pause and to look within to understand how we're feeling at this moment. And often when we're feeding the what ifs and we're distracted, we are, as human beings, we have a hardwired habit. We're creatures of habit. And we form these habits by, by reacting the same ways in different times almost like a cycle going round and round, reacting the same way. And so these habits and these reactions become hardwired. Um, but the good news is that we can rewire them and we can react differently and respond differently um, to the, the same um, uh, event that happens, to the same situations uh, with practice. So it's almost as if we're rewiring um, these, these wires in our brains to new habits, to new ways that we can look into things. But because we, we react the same way, the, the habits are almost mindless. So we react the same way to things mindlessly. So just like we get up in the morning 
And the first thing we do is to pick up our phones and to scroll through them without being aware of, of, of the fact that we've got up this morning to plan the day ahead maybe, to think and check in on ourselves. Or perhaps when we grab a snack or a packet of chips while we're watching TV or while we're um, working. And at the end of the 15 minutes or 20 minutes, we look back at you know, the bag and it's empty. So we're also eating mindlessly because we're, we're so caught up and distracted that we don't think of savoring um, how we're eating as well. So being on autopilot and living on autopilot is almost as if there's somebody else on the driving seat of the journey of life. So to do anything and to, to be able to focus on um, the present moment, to be able to focus on your tasks and be able to do it um, in a more healthy way, in a more present way, is to make sure that we quieten that monkey mind, to make sure that we uh, make new habits and be more aware and present um, by mindfulness and by compassion, um, um, to compassionate ways to, to live our lives. And another concept that I wanted to add um, to the talk today is, is the addiction to being busy. As a society, um, I feel that we are wearing being busy almost like a badge. So it's like a badge of honor. Uh, we uh, go from one task to the other task. Uh, if you ask somebody how they're doing, they show their list of calendar invites and social obligations. Um, almost as if it is embarrassing to be uh, to have free time and to uh, to not be busy so knowing where to focus is a way that we can we can perhaps overcome and um, organize ourselves more so that um, we, we we know that it's okay to to not be busy all the time um, I think we're, there, there are quite a few uh, of us around who might sometimes think we're not spending enough time with families or with our family or friends or um, able to do things that we enjoy doing. Um, so organizing yourself, knowing where to focus and when to focus. Just as um, a hospital has uh, different levels of urgency when a patient comes in, uh, there are different levels of urgency in tasks that you can do. And perhaps this is a way that you can prioritize and, and balance your, your life and, and the tasks that you need to do. Uh, another way that I, another reason rather that I feel that a lot of people may be keeping themselves busy is sometimes that um, being, um, giving yourself a pause and stopping yourself uh, makes uh, you have these feelings of discomfort. So when you're keeping yourself busy, it's almost a form of distraction to those feelings of discomfort that you want to avoid. But we need to, we need to understand that um, it is a part of us. So just like the weather, sometimes it's sunny and sometimes it's cloudy. Um, and when it's cloudy, we know that at the end of uh, a cloudy day, eventually there will be sun. Um, and so just like that, we need to embrace whatever feelings of discomfort uh, rise up when we pause, not to do anything about it, not to shun them away, but to notice them. And that is what mindfulness practice is all about, to notice, to notice and be aware of these feelings. Um, so that you can deal with them with compassion, with uh, being uh, being a soothing, uh, giving yourself a soothing touch, using self-compassion practice to embrace those feelings of discomfort uh, and understand that sometimes the weather can be uh, good and sometimes it can be a cloudy or a, a rainy day. So next we can come on to, we spoke about how um, there are different ways that we may need mindfulness in our lives. And now we're going to be talking a bit more about mindfulness and, and, and what approaches we can use to, um, to manage the issues that arise in our lives and the stress that arise in our life. So this is a, a formal definition by John Gabbardson. 
So John Kabat-Zinn uh, is a professor in mindfulness, and he's in he's in Massachusetts. Um, and back in the late um, 1970s, he developed a program called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction. And it's an eight-week program uh, where, whereby there are different techniques and ways and approaches that we can use um, to add mindfulness to our lives. And he used this, uh, this, uh, the program and applied it um, to patients uh, who were suffering from chronic back pain. And at the end of the eight weeks, the, the patients who had completed the mindfulness training and, and had a regular practice had a different approach to, to pain and were able to manage it in a better way versus those who uh, had not taken this mindfulness program. Um, so from there on, the mindfulness-based um, programs and mindfulness approaches really grew popularity as well as became evidence-based programs, which, uh, which means that there is research conducted as to how um, the effects of this on mental and physical well-being is. Um, so this is a formal um, definition, but the simple definition is that mindfulness is present moment awareness. Moment to moment awareness is what mindfulness, the core of mindfulness is about. Some of the basic fundamentals of mindfulness that I thought would be useful for this talk it is a practice. And so just as you can't, uh, that a, just as a piano teacher can teach a student how to play the keys and can teach him how to play a piece of music, it's only with practice that the student can learn how to play that piece of music by himself and actually learn from it. And so similarly, a mindfulness practice is about uh, practicing and regularly yourself and only then can you reap the benefits of mindfulness in your lives. And when you practice mindfulness, you do, you do that uh, while checking in with yourself, when you're looking inwards to see how you're feeling, how your inner weather is like. And sometimes what you might, what you might find are feelings of discomfort as we discussed. And we do that in a very non-judgmental way. So we're not there to change them. We're just there to notice them and would not judge yourself as to why you're having these feelings that you've discovered. And we also do that with a sense of curiosity, with a sense of beginner's mind, knowing, understanding, asking these questions. Why do I feel this way? What do I feel? Why am I feeling like this? So when you're looking inwards, being curious about how you're feeling and why you're feeling in a certain way. And of course, doing it with a, a form of acceptance, understanding, recognizing yourself for who you are, not striving to be something different. Because when you accept yourself for who you are and you, have, you, you, you conduct mindfulness and you live your life with an, in a non-striving manner, um, you can accept yourself and move on to living in the present moment. So you're not bogged down by changing anything about yourself. And now we come to evidenced, uh, some evidence-based approaches to mindfulness, um, which the first one is mindfulness-based stress reduction. And evidence-based, again, these are all programs that have been researched upon and, um, and have been known to affect um, the a healthy um, a healthy result and 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 ways that uh, uh, they've been very beneficial to people's lives at the end of um, these programs. The first one is the mindfulness based stress reduction by John Gabbitson, uh, which is focuses on the ways that you can manage stress in your lives, um, and then man mindfulness based cognitive therapy involves a, a mix of mindfulness, a combination of mindfulness and cognitive approaches. Um, so focusing on your negative thoughts about how uh, you can um, counter those negative thoughts, about how to catch those negative thoughts, and then to deal with them and approach with them, uh, approach them in a very mindful manner. Um, and then mindful self-compassion, which is how you can uh, look inwards and be compassionate and be self-soothing towards um, towards anything that you do wrong. So often at times our inner critic um, comes up, that voice in our head that tells us that 
we can't do anything right or you know or or, or that you shouldn't attempt to start to do anything because uh, you're not good at do, doing it and and we come back thinking um you know the fear of starting something new creeps up so mindful self compassion is actually just looking inwards to to tell yourself that it's okay to soothe yourself without having to depend on people around you um for compassion it is it focuses on yourself being self compassionate and um to uh, to yourself and not looking at uh, anybody else for compassion and then we move on to the ways the different ways that uh, we can also include mindfulness in our lives apart from um, the evidence based approaches so of, of course there's the guided meditation and versus the non guided meditation which is guided by a, a mindfulness coach or an instructor uh, where they guide you through the meditation and through the breath work but i'd also like to add that it's not um that uh, people assume that mindfulness is just about um sitting practices and meditation uh, mindful living involves a lot of other aspects that you can add to your life such as mindful walking uh, which is which involves going out um into the open going out outdoors and having a sense of purpose on grounding yourself noticing how you're walking one step at a time um perhaps taking off your shoes and feeling the earth to ground yourself while you're walking outside um and you can also look at uh, the sound hear the sounds use your senses uh to be in the present moment using your senses close your eyes when you're when you're going outside for a walk next time and and use your breath and listen to the sounds um of the the trees anything that you can hear near or far using your sense of smell to really capture uh, the essence and and this and this and the and the smells that you can smell around you um just noticing noticing with your senses and noticing with the sense of your touch on the on the grass and um and using those senses to bring you back to the present moment to remind you that wherever you are wherever you go there you are so mindful eating is 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 also something that um i touched upon uh, before when we spoke about you know the the chips packet and the the packet of snack that sometimes we pick up and we eat uh, mindlessly and mindful eating is an approach uh, whereby you can have a different and healthier um manner to or, or concept of of eating where you savor the food that you eat um you slow down the process of 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 eating and and sitting down for a meal um using your senses again the sense of taste and smell to uh, to really get into the the process of of chewing the food and enjoying the food and and this has helped uh, many people to be able to have a healthy approach to me meals and a healthy approach to uh, their their bodies and and the way that they they eat and the choices that they make um to eat as well and of course creatively if there are mindful mindfulness based art Uh, activities where uh, whereby you can uh, do mindfulness uh, a, a guided mindfulness meditations along with art therapy uh, which is a more creative way to express yourself using mindful coloring and other techniques which are often used for kids as well and lastly mindful parenting and of course these are just a few of the approaches and ways that you can that you can in, uh, use mindfulness and and add mindfulness to your life um but for this talk today i picked up one which i thought would be useful for a lot of us um uh, uh, in the community uh which is mindful parenting so of course as parents uh we also have we are also humans we're also we also have different roles that we play in our lives uh we are employees we are uh sisters we are wives um and and so after a long day there there might be something else that has affected us and um and annoyed us or 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 
is the reason that you are actually reacting the way that, that, that you are at the end of the day. So for example, you've had a long day, you've come back home, and your child is, uh, is telling you to, to hear them sing Baby Shark for the fifth time. And, and you, you know, um, are very dismissive and, and, uh, and do not attend to uh, what they're saying or doing at that point in time. Um, and only to regret it later. So, so mindful parenting, the first thing that you can do to avoid um, reacting like that is to put a pause between the time that you that you check in with yourself and you're seeing that trigger come up of anger, of annoyance, of being tired, whatever it may be, noticing your body and what it's telling you. And then putting a buffer, putting a pause in the middle of that. And I call it the 90 second timer because I really do think that within 90 seconds, time yourself using your breath to come back and then respond to what your child is saying or attend to what they need. So you want to respond rather than react in the same way. Because remember, we also spoke about how we are on autopilot all the time. So these hardwired habits and hardwired reactions um, of the way that we, that we deal with or attend to our children at times uh, are are also um, are hardwired reactions. So it and they may be because of various other reasons, external reasons. Um, so just responding to them by checking in with how you're feeling first. Um, ask yourself these questions. Be curious. Why am I feeling this way? Uh, why why would I feel like reacting this way? Um, and you might be surprised at the answers that come up. And um, and then after ninety seconds of that pause of checking in with yourself, you can then respond. And then being present is, is a very important aspect of being a mindful parent. Uh, we are often at times on our phones, um, and again, using our phones at times during family uh, dinners, family gatherings, family time. Uh, and during a lot of my kids' mindfulness sessions, we've had a discussion on uh, being kind, being kind to others, being paying attention to people that are talking to you, paying attention to friends when they're talking to you. And a lot of uh, the kids have often come back to say that their parents, in fact, um, and that the feelings that they feel very annoyed when their parents are on their phones, um, not very distracted by something that they're doing and not really listening to them. And so, and so kids really understand and see what's happening. And um, and so it's very important to be present when you are, you're listening to them. Um, and be present when you're saying, all right, this is your time. I'm going to listen to you. Um, you have to put down your phones um, to be present. So look them in the eye, um, make them feel noticed, make them feel like um, you're physically and mentally present with them um, at that time. And of course, when you're where, when you're conducting mindfulness, when you're practicing mindfulness and um, in your lives and, and you are being kind and attentive and aware, um, you are teaching your kids how to be uh, mindful uh, adults. You are teaching them that this is the way uh, that you're, you, this is the way that you pay attention. This is the way that you can become aware and, and use these tips and techniques, um, maybe take them out for a mindful walk tell them to uh, show them being present and so that they can learn uh, from you and use it in, in their lives as well. And another variation of the, um, the re respond and react is the stop method. And I find that really easy to remember. Um, and so I put it in there today for you. Um, so to, whenever you feel that there is some feelings of anxiety or anger, you stop and you can use this not just with parenting, of course, you can use it with um, before meetings or when you're um, before a big event. So using, so stopping, pausing, um, taking a few breaths and observing, taking a few breaths to ground yourself, observing what you're feeling at the time, observing how you're feeling, what is the weather like inside, why am I feeling this? 
um, and then proceeding with whatever else you have to do. So stop method is basically almost like a pause method, almost like just coming back, stopping for a moment to check in with yourself. And you can do that in during various times um, of the day for whenever you feel a bit overwhelmed. Uh, remember to just stop, observe, take a few breaths, and then proceed. And finally, I think the when we're talking about mindfulness and we're talking about the different ways that mindfulness can help, we um, the most important aspect is of course breathing. So we breathe; it's something natural that comes to that that we do every day without noticing. Uh, but the breath connects us to our body. It connects us to, to being conscious, to being alive. And when we're anxious, the breath tells us that, that you're anxious and there's something overwhelming and there's something uh, which, isn't, um, which, 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 which is different in our bodies, that we're feeling differently than we normally do by rapid breath breathing. When we're outside and running, um, our breathing gets really heavy because we're tired and we're trying to uh, put a strain uh, on ourselves by exercising. So, so the breath is actually your guide to telling you how you you're feeling. And it is also your anchor to bring you back to the present moment. Whenever, you, you don't, uh, whenever you're feeling overwhelmed, whenever uh, you're feeling distracted, un untethered, um, you can use your breath as an anchor to ground yourself, to bring yourself back. So I can invite you uh, now to just take a few, take a moment to check in with yourself. We're talking about checking in with ourselves and, and how the weather is, is inside of us, how the weather is in our inner world. And perhaps we can take a few moments right now to just check in with ourselves, to close our eyes, ground ourselves, putting our feet on the floor, back supported, and then let's just for a minute, while breathing in and out, take a couple of deep breaths. And ask ourselves this question, how am I feeling right now? So we're not here to judge. We're not here to notice. We're just here. We're just here to see. We're just here to notice how we're feeling. Without judgment. Perhaps we're tired. Or angry or sad. Maybe just neutral. Perhaps we've had a long day. Or our body's telling us something. So just listening and noticing to our bodies. And we can, whenever we're ready, we can open our eyes and explore this a little further. So this is a great exercise that we can we can use daily in our lives um, to just check in with ourselves. And I often do that in the morning before starting my day to just check in to see how I'm feeling or something might be overwhelming or I might be reacting unusually. And, and I often check in with myself. So just stop and check in with yourselves. Um, use your breath as your anchor. And before I end, 
I, I would really like to um, to emphasize on on how it, important it is to be in the present moment because the past when we dwell on the past it is not in our control it is already the past it's gone and the future is unseen and the present is really all we have so the present moment is is something which is in our control so whenever you catch yourself going into the past or going into the future nurturing those what ifs nurturing that inner critic that inner voice um, we need to come back and remind ourselves using our breath using these various ways of adding mindfulness to our lives um, we can we can just remind ourselves that the present moment is really all we have so that is the end of my talk today um, and i just wanted to add um, that uh, my platform, Mindfulness Tribe, does offer mental health uh, services and mental health workshops uh, for kids and uh, adults as well. So if you have any questions about this talk or comments, um, you can get in touch with me um, on, on these various ways. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Misha. Sorry, I had to take my mask off there um, as I was as I'm in a different location than I'm that I'm used to. Um, I don't know how. Well, I do know how because you've just given some amazing top tips and strategies. Um, but I, I am in awe of of your um, calmness and your ability to be present, especially with everything going on. So, just want to say thank you so much for actually giving um, a bit. Uh, I would say a, a, a bit of peace actually to to my morning um, because I felt listening to you, I was really really able to reflect on what my mind and body is doing at the moment, and with all the external factors, have you spoken about? And I know we're all going through different things at the moment. Teachers, pupils. Pools, um, parents, with all these external factors, it's really nice to have strategies that are tangible to actually use in our daily lives. Um, just a few questions, if, if you don't mind. Um, there's a lot of comments um, about the Mindful Parenting um, uh, book that was coming up on the chat, um, uh, the John Cabot Zinn book, um, and the inner work of Mindful Parenting. Um, so there was a lot of um, uh, discussions about that. And I don't know if actually parents want to maybe have a, a, a bit more information about that. Um, so what we can try and do is when we do the recording. So I'm going to have to put my mask on. When we uh, put the recording in the newsletter, we'll put some details of that book. Is that OK, Misha? Is there anything else you want to add about that book at all? No, I think it's a, it's a wonderful book to read. He's got a, a a couple of more books as well that would be really good. And I can recommend a few books on mindful parenting that uh, that are personal favorites, and um, that would be helpful. I'm hoping for for those of you who are interested in mindful parenting. Um, I have a question as well, um, Misha. Into, as we enter Mindful March, it is a new concept for some. And actually, um, and you may disagree with this, but this is something that um, I receive, not on a daily basis, but when we bring up the topic of, of mindfulness or even being mindful um, in an educational setting, there are some real people that buy in as such and really believe in it. I mean, even if they're new to it, and there's some that are less educated about it, and it's a new concept, and, yeah. and some also think it's like a buzzword, and it's just a word, or it's just a concept that we just need for now. Um, I mean, what would you say to the community about that? If they're introducing, um, you know, the concept of mindfulness or being present, or however you want to um, answer this question, if they're introducing it at home with their children with their families around the dinner table what would be your top tip of just the way in to start a conversation about this yeah i, I think i think it's just about being aware of of the things that that you're doing so which is why i i added uh, a, you know about being addicted to to being busy for instance or or how we're so overwhelmed with with things but and at times we're sometimes overwhelmed to the point where we don't know when to stop right and where to pause um and i think just that um the essence of mindfulness is of course being taking that pause uh, and and so i think when you're when you look in words where when you realize that um that this needs to stop you know the the cycle of of how your how your life is 
when you're when you feel like there's something more that perhaps um, you're meant to do when you're feeling like it's a bit too much i think that is uh for me one of the main ways that that i actually discuss mindfulness and um and talk to people about it uh, of course like you mentioned there is less awareness about mindfulness um also in this uh, uh, parts of the world, especially or, and all around the world, I think what's important to to notice and and note down is that mindfulness is a very secular approach to um, to how to to living, right? So so it's not um, under any specific religious philosophy. Um, so I, I think that is also a misconception that perhaps uh, people have. Um, it is a buzzword, yes, it is, and and people use it often for uh, a lot of things that they're not meant for. Um, I've I've even noticed. Um, you know, at the, at the grocery store, sometimes uh, that there was something that was an offer, uh, a snack or a, a healthy snack, and and they were using mindfulness um, or a mindful snack rather for, you know, the, the word for that snack. So so people are of course using it, um, you know, regularly um, in different ways, um, and so that's why I think there is that confusion as to what it is. Um, but there's so much material online to learn more about it. Um, there are there are workshops and ways that you can um, just have a little bit of dip and see um, if that is something for you and that is something that you can use to you know it it it, it maybe it is I would like to think that it is for everyone, but uh, but everyone has their own ways of how you know what they want to include uh, or not. And but it's definitely worth um, worth trying out and worth experiencing. I think. Thank you so much, Misha. And we've got a question here about um, what does a self-compassion exercise look like? Okay, so self-compassion self um, exercise, the different ways that you can do it. It, it does involve um, a form of guided meditation. Sometimes it's a form of guided visualization as well. Um, and it involves um, finding your the, the words um, and it is a long process, obviously, finding the words that remember, we, I spoke about the inner voice and the inner critic. And so this, during the self-compassion exercise, everyone has their own individual voices and their own individual ways that they they talk to themselves, uh, you know, let's say, and and um, criticize themselves and put themselves down. So so the first part of it is, is, of course, to find out what those negative thoughts are, to find out, um, you know, what's your what's what's that voice that you keep um, hearing? What What is your voice? And then to to soothe yourself, to to tell yourself, um, you know, to, to soothe yourself and 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 conduct that that meditation uh, with compassion. Um, to to make sure to tell yourself that you don't need anyone else to tell you that you're good enough, for instance. So if that is your your um, voice telling you that you're not you're not good enough, it is about nurturing yourself and and with regular practice, understanding that you are you yourself is what is all you need. Um, you yourself um, is, is all that you need to soothe yourself. Uh, and of course, there are various exercises by just, you know, giving yourself a little rub, um, you know, um, and with the with the sense of touch to just calm yourself down and soothe yourself in moments when when you're really feeling anxious um, and um, and want uh, those feelings of compassion. So the different ways that you can do them and um, uh, yes, I mean, the different meditations and exercises that you could do. Then there's also a self-compassion program, which again is is a, is a, a eight weeks and where you learn different ways um, that you eventually at the end of the program, uh, you can learn those inner voices and ways that you can you specifically customized to you uh, on how you can be compassionate to yourself in your lives. Thank you so, so much, Misha, and thank you for being so detailed in, in, in your responses. And there's a few questions coming through of, of people that would like um, your contact details, which are, are really reassuring. So um, I, what I'll do is I will put them in the newsletter, if that's OK with you, Misha, with, with the recording. Um, and um, I don't know if you're happy. Um, I think you left them on the screen on the last on the last slide. I um, did. Yes, and maybe if we just present them, um, present that just one more time before we before we log off today, and then if anyone wants to note them down, that would be that would be really helpful. Um, I, I know from a you know I'm talking from a teacher point of view, 
Um, we have, you know, we've introduced mindfulness as a topic, as a very broad topic um, at Cranley for the last um, few years. And we've definitely got a way to go into ensuring it's embedded into everything we do, not just for the month or the week of Mindful March. Um, and the children will be conducting an array of different activities um, next week, which is the 7th to the 11th, which will be our designated Mindful March week. Um, and this will obviously go through their tutors and have to follow also um, all social distancing guidelines but you know this again is still a new concept for our community and um, I think it's important that we don't pretend that we that we understand it fully and that we it's embedded into everything that we do but but what it's important to say is that it matters and it's something it's a journey that we want to go on and we want to learn from and thank you so much for, as I said, your insightful knowledge, your experience. And I know we've been discussing and, and we're really hoping that we have you um, doing more for the community in the future um, when, when times move on and we're able to do a bit more, um, you know, face to face and have you um, pass on that expertise and knowledge to the children of our community because it is so, so valuable. Um, and I know kindly to the Cranley community who are listening, Misha has again graced her gratitude and she we, she will be contributing to our Cranley Talking Points podcast series. So I want to thank you as well for that, Misha. Um, thank you so much for your calmness, your positivity and your in your valuable insight. Um, I think I don't think there's any more questions coming through. So it just leaves me to say thank you so much on behalf of obviously our principal, Mr. Michael Wilson and the Cranley community for your time. Um, and I do wish um, you a wonderful week ahead and please do stay safe. You too. Thank you so much, Natasha. It was good to it was good to be here today. Thank you so much, Misha. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.